All right, it's just past 7 p.m. Eastern. Good evening and welcome to tonight's CAOMS educational webinar. Hopefully everyone has had a good summer. It's been three months since our last webinar and I can't believe that we're already now in our fourth wave. Hopefully we can see the end of this soon and once again, try and resume some normalcy, which we keep talking about through each of these webinars. I know that many uh, had a keen interest to travel to Nashville, but have been hesitant for the 103rd Amos annual meeting that is in conjunction with the CAOMS. The dates are listed here, September 29th to October 2nd in Nashville, Tennessee. And I know it's getting a little bit late in the game, but for those who have not had any desire to attend in person, we really want to... Uh, encourage everybody from the CAOMS to still register for on-demand courses. Uh, as is listed here, please log on to amos.org at slash annual meeting. You can log on uh, for on-demand content, which will be available to the end of the year, December 31st. Once you watch a lecture, you just have to fill out a very short survey to claim CE credit. But because this is a joint AAOMS and CAOMS national meeting. I would really encourage as many people as possible to register for this as it's always uh, good to have as many Canadians present. Now for tonight's webinar, Emerging Technologies in CMF Surgery, I'd like to thank Tim White, Director of Marketing, Spine CMF with Dupuy Synthes, Johnson & Johnson for sponsoring tonight's webinar. Tim and his team, including Irfan Jabawala, have been very supportive of the COMS over the years, and we look forward to seeing him again at our uh, upcoming meeting, both in Nashville and in 2022 onwards. At this point, I'd like for us all to watch a brief video from Dupuy Synthes. Craft the fit you imagine, designed by you, 3D milled for your patient. The patient-specific plate for mandible completes the TrueMatch CMF Total Mandible Reconstruction Solution, built to fit each patient individually. Our seamless process matches your workflow and delivers virtual surgical planning, intraoperative patient-specific tools, and personalized implants. Surgeons can now choose plate profile, trajectory, and length hole positions, distance between holes, and their individual angulations. Plan around existing or planned implants to avoid interference. Screw lengths can be predetermined virtually and displayed on the case report. Our patient-specific surgical guides have built-in drill guides that align the plate holes and position of the plate to match the virtual plan. The patient-specific plate for mandible is milled from a solid block of titanium and never bent eliminating induced mechanical stresses as seen with other plates that are bent to final shape. True Match CMF, helping surgeons achieve their goals of accuracy, efficiency, and patient benefit. The patient-specific plate for Mandible. Now you can craft the fit you imagined.
So once again, thank you, Tim, Irfan, and everybody from Dupuy Synthes for sponsorship tonight. And now for tonight's speaker, very pleased to uh, welcome another Canadian, Dr. Daniel Bookbinder. He's a graduate of the University of Montreal School of Dental Medicine and the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. He received his certificate in oral maxillofacial surgery from Mount Sinai School of Medicine and is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. He holds the academic rank of Professor of Otolaryngology Maxillofacial Surgery at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York. Dr. Bookbinder is Chief of the Division of Maxillofacial Surgery, Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery for the Mount Sinai Health System, and Director of Postgraduate Maxillofacial Surgery Training Program at Mount Sinai, Jacoby Einstein, one of the largest OMFS MD integrated programs in the United States. He has published over 120 peer-reviewed articles, lectured extensively on cranial maxillofacial trauma management, reconstruction using free tissue transfer, and computer-assisted CMF surgery. He is the general editor of the AOCMF Surgery Reference, an award-winning, freely accessible internet-based resource dedicated to improving CMF fracture care. He is also the former medical director at Touch Surgery, a UK-based startup that provides a digital, realistic, and interactive surgical simulator for healthcare professionals with a detailed guide to every step of the procedure that enables surgeons to deliver safe surgical care for everyone. The company was ultimately acquired by Medtronic in 2020. Once again, as with all of our webinars, we will plan to take questions following the presentation, so please send them through the chat to our moderator, Tony Chahadi. So a warm welcome for Dr. Daniel Bookbinder, who I think tonight's presentation is very critical as we emerge from this pandemic itself. So without further ado, Dr. Bookbinder. So yeah, I wanted to thank Miller and uh, Tony for moderating the session. And of course, I wanted to thank the CAOMS for the kind invitation and Johnson & Johnson DPS for uh, sponsoring this uh, webinar. So today I, I hope, uh, okay, got it. So today we're gonna take a journey uh, through some of the emerging technologies in CMF surgery. So uh, as you know, through the introduction, I guess I don't need to go over the slide, but I just wanted to give you greetings from New York City, my second home after Montreal. And I wanted to welcome you at, uh, to New York, maybe one of these days when the, uh, when the pandemic will be over, which nobody knows when this is gonna be. So the overview of today's lecture is gonna be uh, discussing a little bit about computer assisted surgical planning. I know you've had a number of webinars related to that. So we're gonna keep it on the light side, uh, discuss some of the patient specific implants, intraoperative navigation, some of the new sort of technology, with surgical simulation, um, HASP, which is a haptic-based uh, planner and 3D printing. Talk a little bit about uh, the future and augmented reality and virtual reality, especially when used for training residents. So I think what becomes very sort of important right now is that uh, we're really unlocking the power of the DICOM data set. You know, in the past, we looked at the DICOM um, data basically as just something where we looked at these pictures of the different projections of um, you know, x-ray views. And now that we're able to take the stack and we're able to manipulate it and use it for um, 3D planning, I think it's become a really very, very powerful tool. You're all very familiar with, uh, with its use in orthognathic surgery, but we're gonna talk a little bit about its use in craniofacial trauma in maxillomandibular reconstruction and also in distraction or craniofacial surgery and the use of custom-made implants and plates. So let's start uh, our journey with distraction osteogenesis. And the reason that I chose to show this uh, case is because this, is, this really illustrates a hybrid way of trying to use the computer-assisted surgery as well as 3D printing. So that's before we were able to, uh, to print uh, foot plates. So this is just a young man, you know, classical cleft patient who has a severely hypoplastic uh, 
uh, maxilla uh, had been repaired as a child, had had several surgeries. And now the dilemma is that you don't want to, you know, the movement, just moving the uh, maxilla forward is almost unphysiologic. So what you want to, and you don't want to move the mandible back uh, because the mandible is in the right place. So the only way to really move the maxilla, the movement that it needs to, would be through distraction osteogenesis via an internal distractor and a Lefort one osteotomy. So just to a few buzzwords here. So what you do is you take, uh, you know, you take your DICOM data basically and create these 3D models. And then what you do is the segmentation process. And basically segmentation means just the creation of different objects that you can manipulate separately. And here you can see what we've done is we have the upper craniofacial skeleton and the mandible in different colors. And of course the spinal cord, which is irrelevant to what we're doing, but that shows you the three different objects. Then we go ahead and create a fourth object, which is the Lefort one osteotomy. And then once we have that, then what we want to do is we want to actually reverse plan. So we want to move the maxilla to where it belongs. And we want to try and figure out not only sort of the vector of distraction, but a way to be able to reposition uh, our distractor and to be able to effectively take the plan into the operating room. So now, like I said, you could do that with 3D printed foot plates that you see here. But in the past, when we didn't have that, we had to come up with a way. So what we did in this case is we looked at the vectors and made sure that there wasn't any sort of interference where the vectors were working against each other. We knew exactly where we wanted to dock the occlusion. We also looked at the soft tissue mask and to see what type of, um, of projection we would get. And then, and we were happy with that. And then basically we tried, this was one of the initial uh, phases where we tried using photo mapping to bend the foot plates, which was beautiful, you know, on, on the uh, sort of on the slide, but however, impractical because we couldn't really, we didn't have a machine that would bend it this way. And then, so finally, what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a model where we can bend it on the model and then reposition it intraoperatively. And of course, now everybody's familiar with the cutting guides and with the predictive holes that you saw in the beautiful videos. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But the idea here was to create a cutting guide so that we can we know exactly where to make the osteotomies. And then we had this other positioning guide for the distractor, which would position the distractor intraoperatively in the exact same position so that we knew that we had the vectors that we had uh, calculated. And then finally, as I mentioned, because we were, we were not able to print the, the foot plates, you can see these are stainless steel foot plates, part of the internal distractor. Basically, so what we ended up doing here is that we ended up uh, printing a 3D model and bending the foot plates on the 3D model and then taking it to the operating room and being able to execute exactly the plan is very gratifying because you can see here, we performed the osteotomy using the guides. We place the foot plates and here's the patient ready for distraction. And you can see early on, the sutures are still in place and the distraction is uh, moving forward. And then basically at three weeks post-op and you can see starting to develop a small open bite. So what we do is we use elastics to dock the occlusion and to prevent the classic open bite that usually happens when you do distraction osteogenesis, whether it's for uh, Lefort 3 or Lefort 1. And here's the patient post-distraction and the retention phase. And again, uh, after debanding, and you can see that we were able to get exactly what we had predicted or what we had planned, I should say, um, uh, using computer-assisted planning. And the only thing that additional thing that we did is we gave them a genioplasty. So I'm gonna really gleam over uh, orthognathic surgery because I, I know that uh, a lot of my Canadian colleagues uh, do a lot of this uh, VSP for orthognathic surgery. But just to mention, I think it's very important to mention, especially if we have residents in the audience tonight, how far we've gone, you know, I'm sure uh, the older folks like me and, and the, uh, the audience still remember using the acetate tracings, but more so burning our fingers with the sticky wax trying to do this model surgery. So the, the paradigm shift from physical to virtual has been tremendous in terms of really advancing orthognathic surgery. I would say it's probably the most important advance in orthognathic surgery since all the modifications of the uh, ovigaser osteotomies, but that's my, my thought. 
just, uh, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of, uh, of ProPlan, but the idea here is to be able to do a three-dimensional um, cephalometric analysis and then to do the planning and even uh, to be able to set the occlusion virtually. And one of the important things that we mentioned earlier is the segmentation. And the idea of segmentation really means to be able to create different objects, in this case, a green mandible, that we can move separate from the rest of the craniofacial skeleton. The other thing that's really important because you're trying not only to set the virtual occlusion, but you also wanna print uh, the final splint. So in this case, what you wanna do is you wanna be able to have a very precise uh, capture of the occlusion, which uh, everybody does right now using intraoral optical scanners, or you can use a tabletop scanner also if you want. And then you create these composite or hybrid models where you fuse uh, using anatomic fiducial, so the cusp tips, you fuse the models to the CT scan or to the cone beam CT scan to get a precise registration of the occlusion. And this just shows you the difference, you know, be, be on, on the blue, you can see the occlusion from the uh, cone beam CT. And then on the two pictures on the right hand side, you can see how precise the occlusion is once you have these composite models. And then you can go ahead and either set the occlusion uh, virtually, or you can actually set the occlusion and scan the final occlusion and just use that uh, as a way to, you know, on block to move your, your maxilla and mandible. One of the things that are really important is, again, to be able to set the, the correct um, a natural head position for many reasons, because if you want to do any corrections um, in three dimensions, especially for the maxilla, if you want to correct the, uh, the yaw, uh, or the pitch or the role of the maxilla, then you really have to set the, uh, uh, the patient in the uh, natural head position. And there are a number of ways that you could do that. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that, but it becomes really important when you wanna correct asymmetries. So uh, let's get into sort of some of the other very interesting areas. And again, the advances of uh, in, in th this type of uh, technology has had in, or the impact it's had for post ablative mandibular and maxillofacial reconstruction has been also tremendous because now we can really get very predictable results. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the work of, uh, um, of the folks down in Texas now where they do this uh, jaw in a day. Uh, basically, you can backwards plan all the way up to the final uh, dental restoration. So uh, you saw in the video these, uh, these very sort of customized uh, uh, 3D melt plates, and they are excellent because they allow you to control the position of the screws as well as the position of the mandibular segments. And you can plan where you're going to place your implants and avoid placing screws in that area. So it's really been uh, you know, tremendous advance for us. The workflow for this type of um, uh, planning is really not very different from what we used to do when we did not have the patient-specific plate. So we work in parallel, and the idea here is just to design the plate, to place the holes, to decide the, uh, the distance between the different holes, and then to get uh, not only the patient-specific plate, but to get also these special guides that you saw that allow you to perform your um, mandibulectomies, as well as placing predictive holes, both in the native mandible as well as in the fibular segments. So let's run through a quick case, uh, courtesy of Dr. Cornelius from Munich, because he has it uh, illustrated very, very nicely. And the idea here is, uh, the, the things that you have to be cognizant of and that you have to, when you're doing your planning, is you wanna know uh, your, your, your donor site, uh, whether it's right or left. And obviously, you know, depending on where you need the soft tissue and where you need the pedicle to exit when you're discussing the fibula, then you can either use the contralateral fibula if you're putting the skin paddle intraorally and the vessels exiting posteriorly, or vice versa, if you want, you can use, you go to the right side if you want the vessels to exit anteriorly. And then if you want the skin paddle on the external surface, then obviously you reverse everything else. So that's really very important before you're planning, you have to decide, you know, what side of the neck you want to anastomose to and where do you want your vessels to come out? So if you have a short pedicle and you want it to come out posteriorly, because you're using one of the upper branches of the external uh, carotid artery, then that's what you need to do. So very important to note that and to decide you know, ahead of time. 
then what you can get, these are some of the things that you're very familiar with. And basically the fibula cutting guide on the lower in the lower picture, uh, the osteotomy guides with the predictive holes and the channels to make sure that you have the correct angulation. And then in this case, uh, Peter decided to have the, uh, uh, the models also printed because he wanted to demonstrate how the fit was and basically both on the models as well as uh, intraoperatively. And here's the patient with a squamous cell carcinoma requiring a uh, right hemimandibulectomy that you'll see in a second um, and a reconstruction. So again, the segmentation, the planned uh, mandibulectomy in red here, and then basically where you want to place the fibula. And the nice thing about it is you can see where the alveolus is by making the segment or the pre-surgical uh, sort of the pre-operative segment a little bit transparent. And then you can place the fibula exactly where you want it to go so that you can place the dental implants that could be used uh, to restore the, the function of the patient. And then you can go ahead and design the plates. You can decide on the spacing of the holes. And you can see here how many holes you'd like in the fibula segment and in the native mandible, both in the proximal and distal segments. And here, Peter decided to do this very fancy sort of uh, tongue and groove type of fibula that uh, in order to be able to place the, uh, the, um, uh, the alveolus exactly where it needed to be. So the beauty of this is we also get CTAs uh, or CT angiograms of the lower extremities, not only to see that uh, there's a three vessel runoff, which is very important, but also to use that, um, uh, that 3D model uh, to perform the virtual surgery of the fibula. And you can see here the two segments with an intervening segment of bone that where the periosteum is stripped off in order to maintain the blood supply, but to allow for that tongue and groove type of um, fit that, uh, that Peter had decided. These are uh, 3D printed plastic uh, cutting guides that you can see with the predictive holes and also with the channels. And, uh, you know, and this is the fibula cutting guide. And then you go ahead. So now you can see it beautifully demonstrated on the models with the cutting guides, both for the proximal and distal segments, the fit of the plate on the model. So you can see it's a very exact fit. And now you take it to the operating room and before you perform your ostectomy or your osteotomy, mandibulectomy, then you place the, uh, the uh, cutting guides and you perform the, uh, not only the osteotomies, but also you drill the predictive holes using the guides to ensure the proper angulation. So you can see after the, uh, after the osteotomies have been performed and the mandibulectomy is being performed and the neck has been, uh, the neck dissection has been performed, then Peter went ahead and placed the, uh, the plate and also used the, uh, the mock fibular segments to show the fit, uh, which you can see fits exactly as per plan. And then uh, when you, you see in the picture on the right-hand side, right lower-hand side, the fibula osteotomies maintaining the vascular pedicle and removing that intermediate segment to allow for the tongue and groove fit. And then he takes that and tries it on the model first and then puts it uh, intraoperatively. Obviously, this is not something that is done uh, every day, but it's just uh, this was, you know, a beautiful uh, sort of demonstration or illustration of the uh, perfect fit that you should be able to get using this type of technology. And this is why I chose to show you this case, because I have tons of cases, but none of them really illustrate it as beautifully as this uh, Peter's case does. And then the inset of the skin paddle intraorally, the anastomosis that you can see here to the external jugular and to one of the external branches of the, uh, uh, one of the branches of the external carotid, maybe the facial. And then this is the, uh, the type of result that you get. So again, you know, I can't, I can't really stress the importance of, uh, or, or the ease that uh, this type of computer assisted planning and patient specific implants has, uh, has enabled a lot of us uh, doing this type of surgery uh, to give our patients really very predictable results. So let's talk a little bit about uh, something different. And these are the peak, the individual peak implants. And also we're gonna also talk about the uh, uh, titanium implants. And here you can see that you can get either peak or titanium implants to, to replace very difficult three-dimensional sort of uh, defects of the craniofacial skeleton be it a zygoma or be it a, a, a cranial defect. So let me just take you through a couple of cases. This is a patient that had a frontal sinus fracture then developed that, that, that was, uh, had undergone an open reduction. 
um, and also in a, a frontal craniotomy. And then he lost the bony segment over time. Uh, he had it repaired with a mesh uh, and a bone cement. Unfortunately, that failed also and became infected. So he had a mesh and was unhappy with the, uh, with the contour of his forehead. This guy is a, was an actor and uh, he was really unhappy about his, the contour of his head. So basically we plan to do this um, peak implant, patient specific implant and remove the mesh at the same time. You can see how you can really contour in three dimension and restore the exact shape of the uh, cranium uh, pre-injury or pre-defect. And you can see the really a very precise um, fit where you can feather edge the peak implant uh, in order to, to really give you an excellent three-dimensional fit. Here, we took the patient to the operating room, uh, went in there, removed the mesh that's in place. And you can see this white stuff is not the dura but this white stuff is just part of the capsule that was around the implant. So we removed the implant. Uh, you could see it up here with the, with the capsule around it. And then basically took the, uh, the peak implant and placed it into, uh, in, in situ and then used some uh, uh, cranial fixation, very low profile plates uh, to restore the frontal bone. And here's the patient, you know, with the uh, with the implant in place. And then here he is postoperatively a few weeks uh, after that. And you can see that we were able to restore really an excellent contour, three-dimensional contour of his forehead. He was really very happy with the result. So before and after, showing you just before and after pictures here. So another interesting case that I wanted to show you was a patient with a hemangioma of his uh, zygoma here. Uh, we had done a, a FNA um, and gotten into a lot of bleeding. And basically uh, we were, you know, we determined that he had a hemangioma and we wanted to replace, to take out the, uh, the tumor and replace it with a peak implant because performing a three-dimensional reconstruction of this defect would be near impossible using autogenous uh, bone and get sort of a decent result. So what we did is the same thing, the segmentation, the uh, planned uh, ostectomies or the planned resection, uh, and then the, uh, the planned uh, peak implant here. And what we do, you're probably familiar by now, uh, what we do is we go ahead and do the, all of the planning, we get the cutting guides, and then we get the implant, and then take the patient to the operating room and via a coronal incision, very similar, we go in, down to the, um, to the zygoma, and you can see the lesion here and basically use the cutting guides in order to be able to, uh, to outline the uh, resection margins. Once we do that, uh, then we go ahead and uh, remove it. Sorry. Uh, then we remove it and use some fixation plates and you can see there's a blue proline suture and that's for the lateral cantopexy because obviously we've uh, disrupted the attachment of the lateral cantal ligament. And uh, just to show you, uh, Post-op follow-up at three weeks, the patient looked pretty good. And then sadly he was lost to follow-up. So I don't really have uh, too many uh, post-op pictures, obviously. This is uh, something that I'm sure you're very familiar with. And this is taking it now to the new technology where you can actually use patient-specific implants for acute trauma. And this is a young man that had uh, nasoethmoid fractures with a pretty significant orbital floor fracture. And what we decided to do in his case is to do a three-dimensional uh, 3D printed titanium plate, very thin, to reconstruct uh, the uh, orbital floor. Uh, part of our treat treating his nasoethmoid fractures, he had a type one and type two nasoethmoid fractures, as well as his orbital floor. And this is uh, basically the planning and you can see the implant in place, uh, the implant, sorry, um, before it was manufactured. And basically you can really restore the 3D anatomy of the, uh, of the uh, uh, internal orbit using this type of technology and, uh, and you know, taking it to the operating room, making our lives much easier. This is just to show you, we went through the laceration. This was an ATV accident. Oh, bad time for this. So I really apologize. Hopefully it will stop soon. And uh, the idea here was to, um, uh, after reduction of his nasoethmoid fracture, and we, we went for a transcontinental approach and were able to place um, 
the 3D printed implant, we also had predictive holes. So we knew we placed it exactly where we needed to. And this is sort of early on post-op, not a perfect result. He's still pretty swollen, uh, but certainly we got the orbit in place. You can see as a little, uh, a little uh, scleral show because of the uh, cicatrix, but that, you know, with a little massaging and so on results in a few weeks. So uh, let's talk a little bit about intraoperative navigation. So one of the ways, you know, uh, obviously using uh, uh, cutting guides or devices that allow you to drill predictive holes. Yeah, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, and this uh, uh, fire drill here or whatever they're doing. So we'll just, I hope that you can still hear me. So the idea of taking the virtual plan and ex execute that precisely in the operating room really depends on two things. You can do navigation. You can also do these very fancy uh, intraoperative CT scanners that you see on the left-hand side. And these are called the O, uh, basically O-rings instead of C, uh, C arms. These are the O arms. And the O arms allow for basically getting a, a cone beam CT scan in the operating room. Let's talk a little bit about navigation and navigation is really nothing more than obviously a GPS in the operating room. And the idea is that most of the navigation is done with line of sight. So you have an infrared 3D camera and then you have these markers uh, um, in, in the operative field. And basically the camera tracks uh, the marker and you register the marker and you register, you do some uh, registration of the patient. Uh, either a soft tissue or a surface registration, or you can use like uh, anatomic fiducials to do that. And as you work on the patient um, and you register the, uh, the instrumentation, you're able to know exactly and precisely when you're looking at the screen where you're operating. So in my mind, and you can see that you can navigate anything, you can navigate an implant drill, or you can navigate a saw, or you can navigate any instrument, as long as you know the measurement between the fiducials or the tri-star that you see up there and the tip of the instrument. I think one of the areas where this has been really very helpful, at least for us, has been in two areas, and this is in the temporomandibular joint ankylosis, because you know the mandible is a moving uh, bone, and if you try to do something with the mandible, you have to continue re-registering it every time the bone, the uh, mandible moves. Whereas when you work in, uh, on, in the skull base, like in ankylosis or intraorbital, basically, once you've registered your patient uh, then, and, and you keep the, uh, uh, the tri-star, which is usually placed on the parietal bone in place, uh, then you're good to go because you don't have to continuously re-register the patient. So let me take you through this very interesting case of an Afghan, a young Afghan woman that came to see us in the Bronx. And she had had trauma as a child and had this very severe ankylosis of her temporomandibular joint. She had been operated several times and had, uh, and had ended up with this really severe right-sided ankylosis. So just to run you through it, this is the placement of the, uh, of the TriStar of the, uh, of the, um, in order to be able to register the patient. And you can see this goes into the outer cortex of the, uh, of the bone. And basically, these reflective balls that you have on the TriStar will allow the, uh, the interaction between the, uh, the uh, camera and the, um, and the patient, and that would be shown on the CT scan in three dimension. I talked about registration. So here we go registering the different points, uh, anatomical points that you, you have. We also do surface registration in order to make sure that, uh, that the uh, that the, uh, the x-ray films are actually uh, congruent with what we're doing intraoperatively. So, you know, the classic uh, approach to the, to the temporomandibular joint that you can see here, we went through a preauricular and a retromandibular approach, and you can see the ankylose condyle. And what's really nice and what I really used to get very nervous about is as you're drilling sort of medially, then you don't know where you are. But using this type of technology and navigating the uh, navigating the drill, you're really able to see where you're going. And you could do that very safely. It's within two millimeters, it's precise within two millimeters. Uh, I had a video here that showed it, but unfortunately, I don't know what happened to the source. I can't find it, but this would show you exactly what you're seeing. And then as you're drilling, so you can see as, the, as, as you're drilling, and here you can see the crosshairs are medial to the ankylosis. So basically it's showing me 
that I've drilled now medial to the ankylosis and I've, you know, and I, and I know that uh, I'm safe in that area and I haven't gone um, immediately to the capsule where I can injure important structures, including an internal carotid. So we've created here a two centimeter gap uh, in order to, uh, to go ahead and place a costochondral graft in this case. And you can see after the harvest of the costochondral graft with the graft in, in place, and we did a, a genioplasty at the same time. Here's the patient sort of early on post-op um, and she's getting using the therabyte in order to, uh, uh, to regain some range of motion. So she's opening out to 30, 33. And then at the, this, uh, at the, the MIO improved to 43 millimeters. And you can see that she has maybe a little bit of uh, marginal um, nerve sort of injury, but uh, with time this uh, went on to heal. So it was just from traction. And then finally, to take you through one other navigation case where we did in, uh, in the orbit. So I showed you earlier where we used a 3D printed uh, patient specific plate, but this is an earlier case where we didn't have that luxury. So what we did is we used mirroring of the uh, unaffected side to the affected side in order to know how much volume we had to recreate inside the internal orbit to try and correct the patient's anophthalmus or hypothalamus. So you can see here's the patient. So there are a few things. Uh, preoperatively, he was unhappy because he had this anophthalmus. You can see that superior groove, the deep groove that he has, which is a sign of his anophthalmus. He, uh, his, medial, his lateral canthus was also a little bit down. He has this anti-mongoloid slant, and he was unhappy with the flatness of his zygoma. So we were planning to do a zygomatic osteotomy at the same time. So we do all the planning using this brain lab equipment here, and we do the mirroring from the left to the right side. And the green is where we want to be, where we want to end up, and the yellow is where he is right now. Obviously, some of it is unrealistic because we're not moving his steroid plates, but we wanted to kind of get the zygoma into the right place. So you can see here again, as we're navigating, so we're using the probe and we're seeing where we are um, and we, we wanna try or where we wanna be. So uh, basically what we wanna do is we wanna add some material until when using the probe, we're looking at the green overlay and not the white overlay, but the green overlay in order to see that this is exactly where we have planned to, to be. And then finally, when we are, we're using sort of uh, this type of technology, you can see now we've moved the zygoma and the arch to where we want to be. And using the pointer, we know that we are able to execute our plan. And just some intraoperative pictures showing you the osteotomies and then the fixation, uh, uh, the lateral cantopexy on the right hand side, um, and the fixation at the arch and the fixation and in the uh, infraorbital rim. And uh, we used at that time, we used uh, stacked alloderm in order to raise the globe. Um, and this was done all uh, intra, um, uh, intraorbitally. And we also used a, 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 a tetrafluoroethylene type of um, uh, titanium reinforced uh, orbital floor uh, mesh. And here's the patient uh, postoperatively. So after the osteotomies that we performed, um, and uh, here's a 3D view of the patient postoperatively using a 3D camera. So you can see it's not perfect, but it's improved when you look at the, uh, especially when you look at the bird's eye view, you can see the projection of the globe. And when you look at the three quarter view, now you see that he doesn't have um, a sunken right globe as he did preoperatively. It's not perfect. I mean, these secondary orbital reconstructions are extremely difficult to, to repair. So, Going sort of into the future a little bit, and this is not craniomaxillofacial, but the, nevertheless, I thought this was something that was very interesting. And there's this new technology that's called augmented reality. So, you know, when you're performing um, a procedure using a uh, navigation, as we mentioned before, so you can see there's the, uh, the line of sight camera, and basically the line of sight has to see the fiducials that you have in order to register the patient. So if somebody walks in front of the line of sight of the camera, it's very difficult to maintain, you know, to maintain uh, the accuracy and basically everything goes red. But also uh, you can use electromagnetic fields to try and mitigate against that. So, so the, uh, basically it wouldn't be a line of sight camera, but nevertheless, you're looking away from the patient and you're operating on the patient. So which is really not something we're used to doing. 
uh, what we want to do ideally is we want to look at the patient and we want to have a projection of the patient's anatomy on the patient in order to try uh, and not look away from the patient. So one of these, um, one of the solutions here is this X vision. And basically the idea is to give the uh, surgeon, I don't know what the Superman sign is all about, but to give the, uh, uh, the surgeon an X-ray vision, I guess that's where Superman comes in in order to be able to spot the anatomical structure that he wants to use. So this, um, this, X vision, uh, this X vision headset basically is, uh, is a very interesting, uh, I don't know why my, hang on, let me see, yeah. Um, is a very interesting proposition because what it does is it allows the surgeon using this uh, wireless headset that you'll see in a second, by using the web, by putting the fiducials in, scanning the patient intraoperatively using an OR arm and registering the patient. And then by putting on the headset that you'll see in a second, uh, now the registration is being done. So by putting on the headset now, basically, instead of having to look away to the monitor, he has a heads up display that shows him and uh, not only the projection of the, uh, of the uh, anatomy onto the patient, but also he can see the three different views, the axial, the sagittal, and the coronal views that you'll see in a second uh, of, the, of the patient projected. So basically in this case, this is a T lift and he's placing uh, pedicle screws. And uh, so he's able to really go ahead and place the pedicle screw. So you can see he sees the sagittal and the axial views. And at the same time, he has a three-dimensional projection of the spine onto the patient where he can really uh, be able to work. So we're working uh, with the company right now. Uh, hang on. So we're working with the company, as you can see, it says cranial surgery here, uh, to try and come up with a module that we, where we can use this exactly for orbital uh, reconstruction and also uh, for, uh, for ankylosis. I think it would be very, very helpful for ankylosis to be able to use this type of system. So hopefully if I get invited in a couple of years, we'll have, uh, I won't have to show you a T-lift, but I'll be able to show you a real um, ankylosis release using this type of system. Uh, before we uh, sort of, as, as we're discussing here, I also wanted to talk to you about this very, very interesting system. I was really very fortunate a few years ago to uh, meet up with, the, uh, with colleagues from the um, University of Uppsala in, in Sweden, just outside of Stockholm. And they had come up with this really interesting uh, device that's called HASP, which is the Haptic Assisted Surgical Planner. It's still not commercial. It's still something that is uh, not being used. By the way, the, uh, uh, the Augmetics heads up display that I showed you earlier is FDA approved. This is not an FDA approved. So I need to let you know that this is uh, still in the, um, basically in, in the uh, research um, phase. But the idea here is very interesting. So the screen that you see on the right-hand side has also these, uh, these line of sight cameras. And then the, uh, the operator really watches, uh, looks at the screen, which is a 3D view, uh, wearing uh, 3D goggles that also have these fiducials on them. So as you're looking around, because if you look at a 3D object on a flat screen, it's still a flat object. But if you have, if you have the ability to look around, it's called parallax, and basically everything moves, you'll see in a second, you're able to really immerse yourself and see uh, exactly the three-dimensional structure of the object. So this was used both uh, for fibula as well as in trauma. And the idea was to be able to get the, not only the 3D view and being able to interact and manipulate the 3D view, but it was also very interesting because you're able to uh, use this haptic-based um, machine device in order to allow you to, um, to look around the object. So I want to give credit, obviously, to the research team. I was just very fortunate to stumble upon this and work with them. And I helped uh, in some of the uh, user interface uh, when we were trying to, um, uh, to commercialize this product. But uh, we're still sort of a ways uh, away, but definitely something that's going to happen soon. So credit to all of these colleagues from uh, um, Uppsala University. So one of the modules that they were looking at and we were working on uh, was a trauma module. And I'll show you really what this is. So you can see this is a projection so that you're able to really work immersively. 
And as you get closer, there's almost a hologram that you, that's floating in space. Uh, you have the handle that you can use to basically take away. So we've segmented all the different fracture segments and you can take them away and then you can go ahead and you can feel the haptics as you're placing them. And you basically get uh, the, uh, um, the two bony fractured ends to, to fit together. And then you, when, when you fuse them, they, they turn into one color. And basically uh, now you're able to see exactly where the fractures are, how do you have to reduce them and how you have to fixate them. So this really allows us for a very, very nice way to be able to do that. And then you can print these 3D plates uh, that are made uh, of plastic, but these are, we call reduction jigs. And basically they allow you to reduce the fractures so that you know that you're not leaving the, ma the mandible too wide, et cetera. So it's really an extremely uh, interesting proposition here that I hope will be commercialized and will be allowed to use uh, one of these days, hopefully not too far into the future. One of the really cool things about it is this thing here that's called a snap to fit. And the idea so that you understand how we were able to get the precise fit, you, all you have to do is paint the uh, two edges of the fracture and then you bring them together and like a magnet, it gets uh, the computer analyzes it and does a best fit type of uh, simulation. And then all of a sudden it just snaps to fit. So all you have to do is bring it close together. You'll see in a second. And once you bring it close together, it basically snaps and then it fits perfectly well. In three dimension, as you'll see here, Pontus is going to move the uh, 3D model around and you'll be able to see that the lingual side is reduced as well. Like magic. Um, one of the uh, other uses that, uh, and this is where I worked with the, uh, with the group here, is really to, to be able to shape the fibula segments and to plan the osteotomies. And this is the user interface we worked on. So we do the segmentation that we discussed. They also have this uh, amazing program that's called uh, um, uh, bone split. And basically with bone split, all you have to do is paint the area of interest in, in one of the bones and it does the auto segmentation of the bone, which is really very quick. So you can see this has been auto segmented here. Once you have the auto segmentation, you can look at the fibula also that's been segmented. You can see the perineal vessel here uh, by the fibula. You can even see uh, if you really look very closely, you're able to see the perforators, not only the vessel, the perineal vessel, but you're able to see the perforators to the overlying skin. And you can see here as, as you move the X-ray vision, so you can, you can look down. So you have, these are the axial views of your CTA. And as you move down, you're really able to track it. And uh, there's also auto segmentation of the perineal vessel. You see all these beads that you see here. You get, them, you get them close to the vessel and then uh, basically through artificial intelligence, it just finds the, uh, the exact path of the vessel so you can see it, see through vessel finder. Uh, once you do that, then you do the same thing. Uh, basically what you wanna do is you wanna uh, do the resection and this just shows, this is an earlier version. Now it's pretty much straight lines where you do the resection. And once you do the resection, uh, then you look at the fibula. And, and as we saw earlier on, you're able to segment the fibula. And what's really nice about the haptic um, arm is that you're able to actually manipulate the segments and you can feel when you're interfering with the, with the native mandible. So you know that the fit is, is good. And you can also plan your vessel so you can see the length of the vessel and how much you can, how much of a size of the pedicle that you have and if it can go down using the CTA of the, uh, of the face, uh, you know, how much pedicle you need in order to be able to anastomose it to one of the branches of the external um, uh, carotid artery. They also worked on, uh, on a way to try and model the uh, skin paddle, but I don't think it was all that precise, but it was very nice um, nevertheless to use in order to demonstrate uh, how to do things. And then uh, the idea here of uh, creating these cutting guides, as you saw earlier, you can have either a flange or you can have a slot cutting guide. And then using very, very cheap uh, 3D printers, in this case, Ultimaker, but now we have a lot nicer printers, a lot faster, you can print these um, uh, cutting guides. And again, this is not in clinical use. So I wanna stress that 
This is just a research project. And then the nicest thing is that you can use this photo modeling that I discussed earlier to create these plates. Um, and eventually, I guess, if we are able to get 3D printers uh, for titanium, uh, then you can ostensibly print your own plates. But here, what, like I said, what we do is we print these plate-like things that will allow us uh, to use as reduction jigs, and you know, especially with complex trauma cases. So this is the, uh, how are we doing with time? I guess we're still okay. So what I'd like to do now is uh, change, go into a very complete different direction and to do another one of sort of my uh, missions here. And I've been really, uh, as, as was mentioned during my uh, introduction here, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the simulation and what we can do to try and train the future generations of surgeon by uh, using uh, sort of non-patients or using simulation and removing the patient from the trainee's learning curve and basically having less sort of issues with, uh, with bad surgical outcomes. So the idea here is really uh, to look at uh, both uh, virtual reality um, and, uh, and immersive virtual reality using goggles like you see here to try and see how we can use uh, how we can improve surgical education. And the idea again is really, you know, the traditional surgical training that we've all been through. Basically it's the see one, do one, teach one, but we know that this has failed due to a large number of reasons, you know, increasing number and complexity of the procedures, the decreasing training time, especially in the US, I'm sure in Canada, it's the same where basically the trainees can only work at eight hours, you know, the difficulty with objective assessment, et cetera. And, you know, one of these studies actually showed that 31% of graduating surgeons were unable to operate independently. So therefore, uh, you know, there had to be a new way of doing it. You know, obviously we're all familiar with this uh, type of graft where fidelity versus scalability and affordability comes into place. You can see on the right-hand side, you know, the conventional on the lower right-hand side, the conventional techniques, you know, basically looking at technique guides, at textbooks, et cetera. Animations kind of make it a little bit more interesting and videos, mobile apps, as was mentioned earlier with like touch surgery that makes it a little bit more realistic and maybe for cognitive task training, it's a good idea. And then, you know, the use of virtual reality, which doesn't replace cadaveric courses or real surgeries, but uh, is much more scalable and obviously safer for the patient. So this is an interesting, another orthopedic company that, uh, that's out of California uh, that basically came up with this sort of immersive virtual training. And we are working with them also to do a, a module for a CMF surgery, but I'll show you why I really like this uh, where this company is going for the, for, the, for, for the reason that I'll mention in a minute. But the idea here, and the, the reason is actually mentioned right here in the middle, it says multi-user procedures, and you'll see why in a second. So the idea here by putting the goggles, now you're fully immersed into the operating room and you're able to practice a procedure really without uh, you know, endangering the patient. And I'll show you um, that, it, that it really does work. It's not a game. Uh, and it, it really does help. So does it work? There was a, uh, a study that was done at the University uh, of California uh, at UCLA at the Geffen School of Medicine. And you'll see here, uh, basically uh, they did the stibial shaft fixation on the so sawbone model. And they had the, uh, the medical student on the right-hand side had gone through the, uh, the uh, virtual um, uh, training and the one on the right hand side has had not and basically they uh, looked at these different parameters like the guide wire placement entry reaming nail assembly etc and they were looking at the uh, you know how well the uh, this medical student be, uh, performed as opposed to this other guy who's looking at the uh, at the manual and trying to figure out how to to place the jig etc so you can see that it took a lot longer and when you looked at it, uh, you can see the difference. The, uh, the virtual reality trained uh, medical student is in the light blue and the, the gray is the, uh, the uh, medical student that used the, the sort of the classical textbooks and, and instruction manuals. And you can see that in every category here, um, the uh, VR trained resident uh, performed a lot better, 230% better to be exact. 
So this is really why I thought it was interesting, especially, you know, in the cases uh, like we do in orthognathic surgery, et cetera, where we have to interact with the, uh, uh, with the um, scrub team, you know, with the scrub nurses or the scrub techs. And it's very difficult to explain to them, or if we have complex procedures where we have a lot of sort of plates and screws and different instruments. And the idea of being immersed in this VR environment as a team and being able to do uh, something. So you can see here, basically you can ask your colleague here to, to hand you something or assemble something for you. So you can basically train with your scrub decks and you can say, okay, pass me the Lavoisier retractor and they'll be able to pass it to you. And you can go through the whole procedure so that they learn how to do it. So I think from that point of view, being able to interact, you know, immersively with, uh, with the diff with different people or, you know, a more senior and a junior resident, uh, basically really makes it very, very interesting for the future. And I think that this is something that we should definitely be looking into. And then finally, what I wanted to do is I wanted to come all the way back home and to discuss with you a project that we did uh, with the National Research Council of Canada a couple of years ago. And the idea here, it was a grant from the AO Foundation, the Swiss-based foundation, where we um, uh, tried to build or where we were successful in building this uh, 3D simulator, a high fidelity simulator. It's a little expensive, so not everybody can afford it, but we wanted to do a proof of concept that we could uh, actually use a high fidelity simulator to try and train residents to do procedures. But we wanted, we wanted to be uh, multifunctional. Basically, we wanted to be able to have different modules in it that we put in for CMF surgery, spine surgery, and for uh, trauma surgery. So uh, it's a uh, it's really uh, allows for bimanual interactive practice. I think for those of you um, at the Montreal General or who have had a chance to go up to the MNI, they have this thing, and it's called neuro. Uh, I think it's called NeuroTouch. And basically the idea here is that uh, you work by manually. So you have a suction and you have an instrument that you work with to do your dissection and you get the visual and haptic feedback and you use that same type of technology that I mentioned where you get parallax so you can look around the 3D object. So you see things in three dimension. I mentioned earlier that we had the CMF module, a spine module and trauma module. And of course, um, what I would like to do is just uh, discuss the uh, CMF module. And it was a pretty interesting uh, experience that we had. This is what the hardware looks like. You have two haptic arms and then you have these interchangeable instruments that are real instruments that go into the haptic arms to really give you the feel of what you're supposed to be doing. You have a touch screen and then you have another screen that records um, exactly you know, your, your data and, and uh, that you know, in terms of what your, um, uh, how your performance is going. And these are some of the instruments that we had. We had a bipolar, a periosteal, an orbital retractor. We had an endoscope to verify the placement of the uh, plate for orbital floor reconstruction, a screwdriver, an implant applicator, just like a, a forcep, and then screws and a forcep. And basically, uh, the, the nice thing about it is once you clipped on the different tool, whether it be a suction or a retractor, the, uh, the, um, there was a, a complete dynamic tool recognition. So basically on the screen, you saw the instrument immediately, the handle of the instrument that you just clipped onto the arm, to the haptic arm. And uh, the user interface was such, it was pretty straightforward. And basically these are the metrics that, uh, that it uh, kept for you. And it told you how you performed um, on, on the exercise. And the exercise that we chose uh, basically, we had the different tasks. We had a fracture exposure where you used your periosteal to elevate the, the periorbita and to look at the fracture and then to identify the posterior ledge. The second part of the exercise was the insertion of the plate over the fracture to make sure that you engage the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the posterior ledge. And then finally, we had a force duction test to make sure that you didn't entrap anything while you uh, placed your... Um, your plate and the plate was actually not only placed but screwed onto the infraorbital rim as you'll see in a second. Uh, so basically, you know, it's uh, it sounds very simple, but we really had to go not only through the anatomy, but we also had to look at the biomechanical um, characteristics of the different uh, tissues that we had to encounter 
in order to try and produce this haptic feedback, which was realistic. So we had to really look at the, uh, you know, at all the tissues. We even had to look at basically what the prolapse periorbita would feel like so that when you're able to lift it, then you can really feel that you're lifting it. Then we had to go through the very precise anatomy in order to really sort of be able to, um, to create a very realistic 3D model. Once we did that, you know, the step was basically using a malleable retractor to retract the orbital. And, and we also checked and made sure that you weren't putting too much pressure on the globe, because if you did that, obviously you know that you could damage the globe. So if somebody, if the, uh, if the person practicing did that, then you got a warning sign that you're putting too much pressure, too much retraction. So it was really very, very um, uh, realistic. And you can read, you know, in, in the metrics here, basically um, adequate stripping of the periosteum was one of our metrics, uh, breaching the periorbital tissue uh, and going into the fat, high forces on the globe, and then how long it took basically to be able to do that until we got to the posterior ledge. And this is from uh, pictures from the surgery reference that we use in order to try and, and build our scenario. And then basically the manipulation, the 3D manipulation of the plate to make sure that you had the uh, defect covered. Uh, so entering the maxillary sinus or not reaching the posterior ledge where the errors, entrapment of the soft tissue where the errors, again, high forces on the globe, and then uh, the things that we tracked in, uh, on, the, on the bottom here. And then uh, we took uh, and fixated the two uh, screw, fixated the plate with two screws, and you really got the haptic feedback as you were placing the screws. And then finally, what we did, we wanted to make sure you got good hemostasis, so we mimicked a little bit of bleeding because we wanted to make sure that you didn't end up with a retrobulbar hem uh, hemorrhage or hematoma. Uh, and then again, we checked for all of these things that we'd been mentioning all along. And then finally, the force duction test, which was after you finished everything, then you picked up the forceps and then picked the conjunctiva and went through the motions in order to make sure that you hadn't entrapped. So obviously, uh, what we did is we had a random um, uh, we had a random program that caused in, uh, entrapment because obviously it's very difficult to mimic the entrapment uh, realistically. So like you could do this 10 times and three out of the 10 times you end up with entrapment and then you'll feel that you have a positive, uh, um, you know, when you're doing your force duction that basically you had limitation and then you can go back and try and free up the soft tissue. And here, I just wanted to show you a quick video that really demonstrates the whole thing. So it starts with the elevation of the uh, periorbita, uh, the periosteum and exposure of the uh, of the orbital floor that you can see being done with a periosteal. And then uh, this the section needs to go all the way uh, to the back to look at the posterior ledge. I, I forgot to mention one thing. We also had this virtual endoscope where that you could put in after you put in your plate to make sure that the plate went all the way to the posterior edge. And it gave you a very realistic sort of a view of where you had your plate uh, in, real, in real life. So now you see here we're taking the plate and we're take and we're inserting the plate, making sure that the retraction was adequate and that the plate covered the defect. And then once you do that, then you go ahead and place the screws. And remember, this is a two-dimensional view, but you have to imagine this as a uh, as a three-dimensional uh, using you know using the three D glasses and using the. Uh, the fiducials on the glasses. So one of the issues that we had early on, and you can see how the plate is floating, which is unrealistic. So we went back and we had to tweak that and that was fixed in a later version. Sadly, there's only one of these uh, uh, simulators uh, in place right now. We were hoping to get it uh, uh, commercialize and to be able to build more of these, but uh, the grand the grant ran out, and then we hit COVID, so everything was on hold. But uh, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, restart this project at some point. So you can see here the placement, which is was a little problematic again. So we had to work on really getting the screws uh, properly aligned. And now with the with the newer version, actually, you can see that um, uh, that you know, we've, we've been able to do that. But this was really a tremendous uh, collaboration with, the, uh, with a great team at the, at the um, NRC in Boucherville, just outside of Montreal, which was great because I got to travel to Montreal a few times.
So the idea here, the benefits of this type of training really is, I mentioned that you take the patient, uh, the safety of the patient, you take the patient out of the equation and also uh, the apprentice, basically, they don't have to worry about uh, making uh, mistakes that, uh, that would be very costly, not in terms of lawsuits, but really hurting uh, another human being. You're able to practice, you know, your skill development, your psychomotor skills without the uh, the stress of the OR. We also had like a special, um, we had a special vest that you could wear and that 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 monitored your blood pressure and your heart rate, and we're able to see the portions of the procedures that were the most stressful for the uh, people trying it out, so that this way we knew, you know, where to stress, you know, in terms of teaching uh, these areas of the procedures. It, it is a standardized environment, so you can have a very good assessment, and obviously the metrics would be important. It is self-paced and self-directed. You get immediate feedback, as you saw. You had that second monitor that told you exactly the mistakes you made or the time, you know how much time it took to do what you wanted to do, and it it was a it is a very good uh, device to speed up the skill acquisitions or the motor skills because the idea here. We wanted to move this uh, learning curve a little bit to the left in order to get the uh, uh, trainees up to speed. So with that, I think this is it. So I wanted to really thank everybody for allowing me to take you through this journey that I've been going through over the last maybe five or six years and to, uh, you know, to open it up for any questions that you guys may have. And again, to thank everybody for listening to me and for inviting me to participate uh, with the CAOMS, which is very uh, dear to me, obviously, as an, uh, as a, I was going to say an ex-Canadian, but I'm still Canadian, just expatriate right now. Thank you. Great, Dan. Thank you for uh, a wonderful presentation and for sharing uh, all these projects that uh, are undoubtedly keeping you very busy. Um, there you know, I think we have we have a great audience participation today in, in this webinar with, with great attendance. Um, so I'm just going to throw out there that anybody interested can send me uh, a question that I can ask Dr. Buckbinder through the common chat feature uh, of Zoom. Um, Dan, one of the things that that comes to mind initially um, is the you know the amount of you know, whenever you get involved with digital technology, be it an implant surgery personally or an orthognathic surgery, as, as you do quite often, I imagine, um, that you mentioned the learning curve and the time involved with the development and acquisition of this knowledge and its clinical application. And I just, <clears throat> I look at the, uh, the there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a balance between actually executing surgery and the amount of time that you can dedicate to the adoption of, of technology. Is that something that preoccupies you, or is, is that something perhaps in your academic role where you you, you foster and, and obviously you want to be on the cutting edge of the development of these things? But for is it something that preoccupies you as a clinician in terms of your ability to continue to help people? Yeah, no. So I I, I think this is a great question, and undoubtedly I think that uh, you know the the learning curve is pretty steep for some of this technology. I think. We're, uh, you know, suckers like me that really sp spend a lot of time uh, trying to make it a little bit more, um, you know, foolproof and easier for the others. Uh, you know, it, it really pays off because I have to tell you that, uh, you know, I, I can't, um, I haven't been to a single presentation, you know, on, on head and neck reconstruction where this type of technology has not been used. And I have to say that, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, even maybe 18 years ago, when we started really working with Materialize on the first prototypes, it was, it was hell and it was a nightmare and it took so long. But the idea here is, and I think there's a paper that just came out for orthognathic surgery um, and, and JOMS that showed that really uh, this type of technology right now, you know, doing uh, virtual planning and, and, uh, and patient specific plates was actually taking less time than the traditional way of doing it. So yes, you know, there, there are a lot of tweaks that happen and that's why there are all these things out there. But, uh, you know, the idea eventually is to make it uh, less time consuming to be able to adopt this type of technology. Financially, I imagine that, you know, access to some of these technologies 
could be a factor and from a prohibitive cost perspective, right? Yeah, so so that's the whole idea. And, and that's why I love what uh, Fayette Williams is doing down in uh, Texas. You know, I mentioned earlier this John a day. And basically what he decided to do, you know, he took the best of everything and, and uh, is trying to use um, uh, like open source software to plan these cases and using very simple, you know, um, consumer type 3D printers or almost consumer type. They're a little bit more than consumer type, but, you know, relatively inexpensive printers to be able to do that. So that's really the goal. The, the goal is to be able to do a lot of point of service. Obviously, you know, nobody's going to take the responsibility to printing 3D titanium plates, you know, with all the medical legal and the quality, uh, you know, assurance, etc. So I don't think that our sponsors, Johnson & Johnson, need to be worried about that. But I certainly, I think, you know, there, there are many ways where we can use point of service and use very cheap open software to, to, to allow more people to, to adopt this, especially, you know, in, in countries where that are not as rich as Canada or the United States. Um, <clears throat> if, I hope you don't mind, I have another couple of questions for you. So- Absolutely. Um, I, I don't do reconstructive surgery. Many of my colleagues listening to your presentation do uh, <clears throat> extensive uh, maxillofacial reconstructive reconstruction and, and free flap reconstruction. But my question too relates to the concept of virtualization of a surgical procedure. So from my personal experience, occasionally when we're encountering complex uh, surgical procedures, as an example, in orthognathic surgery, and we virtualize them, we fall into potentially fall into a trap where something seems possible virtually. And of course, experience will eventually dictate that you learn what is possible and what is not possible virtually. But uh, do you encounter that often in terms of the, 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 in the endeavors that you've shown us? Yeah, absolutely. And I think orthognathic surgery is, is the perfect example because, you know, initially when I uh, started, doing this and now I see my a lot of my residents do this and they are basically working with the engineer and they're working on this 3D skeleton model and they get they get really sucked into it because they're like moving things in ways that that you can't move number one and b is they're completely uh, you know forgetting about the clinical exam and forgetting about the interaction between all these bony movements and the soft tissue so I insist now we do a, for every VSP that we do, there's a, there's a small PowerPoint presentation that has all the soft tissues on it and has all the measurements on it. And basically, you know, not to forget that, you know, this is only one tool in your toolbox, you know, the VSP, but really what, what's most important is exactly what you said and to really look around the whole thing and to, and to see what the impact of these crazy movements that you think you can, you can perform very easily on a skeleton and where you've segmented a blue maxilla, you can put it anywhere, you know, and, 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 and this is completely unrealistic. So yeah, you have to be very careful. And as a matter of fact, we're working with the, uh, with the company right now to, um, to incorporate a lot of that so we have you know my uh, some of the pictures that i showed the 3d pictures i had to buy a camera for one hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars many years ago like 10 years ago uh, it's what's called 3d md and now you can actually use your iphone 11 plus and use uh, this bellis uh, software and you can get the most amazing you know obj pictures in 3d so we we take pictures now in 3d of all our patients and we incorporate that into the planning to make sure you know i want them to understand that uh, you're not working in a vacuum but you're working you know you have to understand the interaction between the soft tissue the aesthetics you know the the, the, the physiology of the movements as i mentioned when i showed my um, you know my uh, uh, distraction case yeah so the bellis uh, app photo is exportable to people yes. like that are doing the, uh, or to the engineers that are doing virtual surgical plans? Absolutely. You need either an STL or an OBJ file. So, so basically we, we send them OBJ files and they're able, instead of showing you, instead of showing you that uh, CT scan mask, you know, like that sort of gray thing that I showed for some of them. Now you're able to actually put the 3D picture on it and the Bellis and, and the thing with Bellis, as you know, 
it's a free app, but you have to pay 99 cents to download the, the picture each time you download the picture. So, I mean, it ends up costing a dollar or seven exactly because of the, of the taxes that they add to it, but it's definitely worth it. You know, we have, uh, we have actually a phone that, that I used to use that we don't use anymore for, you know, for, and basically we just use it to take Bella's pictures, 3D pictures. Yeah, that, that, that app also became popular recently with the custom fabrication of uh, masks for... Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the COVID, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, somebody, one of the questions alluded to a topic that I think you addressed, and which is the concept of improving management in the OR with nursing assistants and surgeons with step-by-step -step protocols yeah. and virtualizing <clears throat> tissues better. I think that you addressed that there was a, a module that you had in one particular procedure that yeah uh, enhance the team collaboration yeah so so one of the other things that we're doing uh is we were that i didn't mention uh, because of time limitation is that we're looking at doing a a a, um, a tool that's almost like a block black box in the operating room and basically what it does is it characterizes the procedure uh and there's a screen you know in every operating room so basically what it does is let's say you're performing a tracheostomy and there are 12 steps and basically it takes each step and then it puts up for the uh for the or tech it puts up the instruments that you need for each of the steps and this is a way to try and work as a team so you can do it for orthognathic surgery but obviously that would take uh, many many more steps than 10 or 12 steps right. but the idea was to try and do that and and at first you know we wanted to do it for open procedures and then the company at the time which is touch surgery then decided to do it because it's a lot easier to record uh, endoscopic or laparoscopic procedures they went that way or microscopic procedures because you basically have the optics and you're able to record in a small, you know, closed field, whereas with an open field, it's much more difficult to do. But it's the same idea. It's very, very important to be able to, to train a team, you know, and, and then after you do all of that, then you have to do a case at two o'clock in the morning and you have an OBGYN uh, scrub deck that looks at you like you have horns growing out of the side of your head. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's very frustrating, but obviously we'll never get to the efficiency that, uh, you know that that we'd like to but but that's a, that's definitely a great idea and this immersive thing with the vr uh, would be a great way of doing it it'd be amazing to have that vr concept yeah. for orthognathic surgery and, and yeah. Yeah. facial trauma yeah. obviously yeah and and one of the nice things with that and or with these heads up displays is just think about that you know uh, a lot of the procedures that we do only the operator can see what they're doing so if they're wearing this type of device and then you as the teacher have the device and can see what they see, uh, that would make it, you know, even, even, you know, if you have an iPad, you know, and you're sitting away from the field and you have an iPad and you can show that this structure, that's the facial nerve here, blah, blah, blah. So you're, you're really, you know, it's amazing. I, they're using it in industry right now, you know, when they go and do these projects um, and, and, you know, very super, you know, technical projects, they basically have somebody that looks over their shoulder, you know, via the, uh, this heads up display and then explains to them what to do, you know, what, which wire goes where we could do the same thing in surgery. Right. From a teaching perspective, uh, we obviously look forward to the day when some of the concepts you've shared with us could be used for teaching conventional orthognathic surgery and, uh, yeah. and implant surgery as well, I guess. Yeah. 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 Yeah, implant surgery, you know, sorry, we didn't touch much on, but, you know, I just tried to, of course, yeah. give a quick overview, but obviously that's a whole other field. Yeah. Right. right. Um, Dana, really, really, on behalf of the Canadian Association, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm, I'm very impressed with the, uh, your energy and, and getting involved <laughs> with these procedures and, and your dedication to this. And, uh, and I am very proud of the fact that you are a, a fellow Montrealer and, uh, cool. and Canadian, so. That's awesome. Point for Montreal. You saw that right there, hey? Yeah. Yeah. I hear all you. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you. Th I wanted to thank also all the participants for hanging in to the very end. So thank you for doing that. Again, thanks, Miller, for your invitation and uh, and for Irfan for sponsoring it. And mm. uh, hopefully, maybe, maybe one of these days we're able, we'll be able to interact in person, even though we're talking all about this virtual stuff. 
but it's it's always nice to be able to see colleagues so thank you just a couple of little housekeeping uh, items uh again i'd like to thank also thank the team at uh, the pre synthes and i'd like to let everybody know that the coms will hold its next webinar on wednesday october 20th uh where we'll hold our annual business meeting and welcome our new canadian association president and executive council for 2021 and 2022 and obviously all of you are obviously uh, super keen at watching your emails for our upcoming newsletters and more information that will be forthcoming on this issue uh, thank you so much, Dr. Buckbinder, once again. Um, I hope to have the opportunity to see you soon in, in person at some point, and uh, we truly appreciate your, your presentation. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.